So in 1517, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg Church door, and in doing so, he was asking for a conversation to happen, a debate, a scholarly debate. He wanted to challenge the church to some of the things that they were doing because how he was reading Scripture was very different than what they were teaching and doing, and he wanted to reform the church. This was not a foreign thing. People would hammer things to the door all the time to invite debate, to invite conversation. It wasn't like he was destroying property or something. You know, This was something that was done. And there were plenty of people that had the same thoughts as Martin prior. Hundreds of years before, people were saying some of these same things, but they were being excommunicated out of the church. Some of them even killed because of heresy. But for some reason, when Martin Luther did it, it caught on. And I think it had to deal with the time frame that he was in. This is the Renaissance period. Minds are exploding. New art forms are coming to life. The printing press is now available. The world is now round, not flat, right? And Martin Luther did this on a very uh, interesting day because the next day is All Saints Day, and he knew that the church would be full with people, and so he was pretty smart to put it on the day when the most, get the most bang for your buck, if you will. So there's Martin Luther challenging the church to reform. He didn't want to create a new church. He didn't want a church named after him. He wanted this church, this universal church, to consider what the Bible is saying about God and turn back toward that. Because they were busy taking advantage of people or doing things to, 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 to make money, to build a church. And he looked at it and he says, there's nowhere in here that it says that you can buy your sins. You can buy forgiveness for your sins. And so Martin Luther studied scripture like we're studying today in Jeremiah. He knew this prophet was speaking to people in the exile that were struggling to find out who they were without their temple, who they were without their homeland, who they were as a people of God. Where is God in all of this? And Jeremiah looks at them and says, there's a new covenant that God's going to give us. It's not like the old covenant that God gave to the Israelites as they fled Egypt and as they made their way across. Remember, they broke that covenant. No, this is a new covenant, and God's going to write it within you. God's going to etch it on your heart so that way you will know God, that God has chosen you to be God's people. And all of your sins, God's going to forget them. This is this new covenant. What an amazing promise to give to the people. They don't have to do anything to have their sins taken away. So Martin Luther also read from, the, from Paul as he writes to the Romans. Paul's writing to the Romans and says, all of us have fallen short. All of us are sinners. I sin, you sin. You sin a lot, Daniel. I know you do. But... <laughs> we all sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, which means we have no, we have no way of getting around it. And if that's the case, then we need something that's going to take care of all of those sins. And Paul writes, that's what's called grace. We have this gift of grace. We don't deserve it, but it's given to each and every one of us. It's poured out on top of us. It's given to you. You don't have to take it, but it's still given. You don't have to use it. It's still given. You can ignore it. It's still given to you. It's outpouring over you. It is, it is gushing forth over you. It is overflowing on top of you. This grace, it's covering every single one of us. And it's given to us not because of my faith, not because of your faith. We don't have the ability to do that. We don't have the power to do that. Paul tells us it's given to us by the faith of Christ, that Christ had enough faith to go to the cross and die for our sins, past sins, present sins, and future ones. Those are wiped out. The old way of the law these people thought of, that if I do good, I should be rewarded. If I do bad, I should be punished. That's not grace. That's not grace. Paul's inviting them to look at a new way, to focus on God in this new way, to reform their thoughts. Martin Luther also read from the Gospel of John, and he knew that this entire gospel was written that we may come to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that we would have life in his name Paul, uh, Martin Luther knew that at the beginning, uh, all the signs that John writes about in the Gospel of John, they point to the Messiah. All the I am statements in the Gospel of John point to the Messiah. Even the very beginning of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It points to Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. So in the eighth chapter, when Jesus is talking to some Jews, they're starting to believe that he is the Messiah, and he looks at them and he says, if you continue in my word, you're going to know the truth, and that's going to set you free. 
And this is where their old way of thinking comes in. Wait, 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 wait. Free? We've never been a slave to anyone. But they've forgotten their history. They've forgotten the Egypt. They've forgotten Moses. They've forgotten the promised land. They've forgotten the exile. And Jesus looks at them and he says, but you're a slave to sin. You can't free yourself. But in my Father's house, in, my, in God's kingdom, in that dwelling place, there's no place for sin there. It doesn't exist there. The Son exists there. And so if the Son makes you free, guess what? You're free indeed. And those sins are gone. The old way of thinking is gone. Turn toward God. Martin Luther must have been very brave and scared to do what he did because so many people had died prior to. He didn't know what was on the other side of it. He just knew he could not justify it anymore operating in the way the church was doing. The way he read the Bible, the way he understood Scripture, he couldn't do it anymore. And so he was turning toward God. He had been reformed. He didn't know what was on the other side, but he knew that's where God was. And he was going that direction. Jeremiah must have been scared to death to write to those people in exile. He didn't know what was on the other side of it either, but he knew that's where God was calling them. And so he's pointing these people to God, to focus on God, not the old ways. Let's reform our thoughts and focus on God. Paul is writing to a group of people that are probably scared to accept Christ as the Messiah, and he's pointing to them to grace, to God, to this forgiveness that's available to us. And Jesus is doing the same thing with the Jews and the disciples alike. We're in the middle of a reformation. We each have old ways of thinking. In the 30s, the word prejudiced meant old ideas, hardened thoughts. We have those things right now today. There are things that we hold on to that we say, nope, you're not going to be able to change my mind. Nope, 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 never, 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 never. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. I'm not going to do it. And if you can think of one thing that that's in your life, congratulations, you're in need of a good reformation. A reformation invites us to consider those old ways of thinking and maybe, just maybe, we turn toward God and ask what God wants of us. We don't know what's on the other side of it. That can be really scary. It's a lot easier to sit here in my own misery. At least I know what I'm going to get. But if we start to look at where God's leading us, I can promise you this. The results are sacred. The results are divine. The results belong to God, not to us. We don't have the faith to save us. We don't have the ability to forgive our sins, but God does. So today we're being asked to consider our old ways of living and reform to the new ways and turn our thoughts and our minds toward God. Amen.